our next wonderful speaker. Yes. Um, thank you, uh, Jay, for coming and helping us. Uh, we're always welcome. You're always welcome here. And uh, hopefully you can tell us more about uh, Toronto's green spaces. Okay. I actually plan to talk about um, a broader context. The needle. So they can process 10,000 people there every single day if they had the quantity of needles they need. And so we are pushing for that. Right now they've run out. But they, if they had the, the fridge fulls of needles, 10,000 people could be processed in one day. And so I'm very, I'm very pleased with that. Uh, I advocated aggressively for it at, at City Hall. And um, it got sanctioned and up and running a few weeks ago. And it's just been gangbusters. Plus, not just that at East York Mall, but also the pop-up at the mosque on the weekend processed a couple thousand people. Plus, I want you to know that we're going into the bottoms of the buildings like the foyers and we're vaccinating people as they come off the elevators. And we have tables set up and just vaccinating anybody who's willing uh, right into the buildings. So there's been extensive work. I'm not going to I'm not going to go any farther into that because it would take me forever to tell you what we've done in the Toronto community housing buildings there, etc. But it's been a priority. And I'm telling you, there's been top notch service there. So I'm very happy about that. Uh, and that, that's, that's something that we can all be happy about that we've supported Thorncliffe Park, which is not very far from you, just east of you. So uh, through this very challenging time for them. So I just want to touch a little bit more on COVID and say, you know, this has been very frustrating for me to watch this roll out. My, my background is logistics and project management and watching this roll out has been frustrating. I felt like we were gaining momentum in the last two weeks. Now there's been more unfortunate news that uh, Moderna has cut their, they've been slow with the, getting their needles to us and then cut their quantity. Um, and then there's been some setbacks with the J&J &J vaccination. Um, and it's, it's just frustrating. But I want you to be, um, feel like, it, you know, it is in hand. The problem is there's too many cooks in the kitchen. The federal government secure the vaccination the province distributes them and then we're responsible. Um, we were told about this very late in the game to get them, you know, the needles and arms. So it's a collaboration between the city and the hospitals, which we have the best hospitals, honestly, in North America, in Toronto. We're so lucky. The hospitals we have here are phenomenal. I'm working closely with each of those CEOs, North York General, Michael Guerin and Sunnybrook. I talk to them pretty regularly, especially Sunnybrook because it's right in the heart of the ward and probably talk to the CEO three times a week. And it's a very trying time. So anything you can do to support hospital workers at this time, um, bang your pots, whatever you can do, uh, let's keep them strong because it's a very, very difficult time for them. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, COVID is a big challenge. It's been very difficult to navigate. It's been very frustrating. I hope all of you out there have needles in your arms. Um, and I'm pushing, advocating very strongly to get that second needle going. Once we have the quantity, we clearly don't have the quantity in the next couple of weeks, but I'm really hoping that when we see a, you know, a, a, the sheer number of, of vaccinations that will come if Moderna uh, recommits to the original amount. Um, we, I'm really hopeful that we will get that second needle in your arm if you've had the first much sooner than the date on your receipt. That's what I'm advocating for. Uh, I, my concern is with seniors. Um, we want to make sure that they're protected because they are the most vulnerable, yeah. um, quite frankly, victims of COVID. So I want to make sure my seniors are protected. And I've been advocating for seniors throughout this entire process with the mayor, with the mayor's office, with the medical officer of health and with Chief Pegg, who's running the Emergency Operations Center. So I'm gonna leave it at there. If you have any questions on COVID, feel free to ask, but I'm gonna move on to um, tell you a little bit about what I do at City Hall, and then we're gonna zero in um, on good old Midtown, where most of us live. So uh, I, I don't know if you know this, but I am the chair of the TTC. It's a huge uh, portfolio. I'm very proud to 
and honored to have this portfolio. It's something I've actually really dreamed about for years. So the fact that I'm in it now has just been uh, fulfilling a big dream for me. Uh, it might sound funny to you, but I just love the fact that it's really a network that provides uh, the spine of getting people around the city. It's the heart and soul of the city, in my opinion, because it allows people to work, live and play and to get there, hopefully safely and reliably. So um, I just want to tell you a quick good news story because it just happened 48 hours ago. And if you're an environmentalist, I think you'll like this story. We just approved uh, and moved uh, the committee meeting this week to purchase 300 more green buses, electric buses. So currently we have 60 and we will have a total of 360 when this purchase is complete. And I think this is a wonderful target and it really is gonna help us with our overall uh, reduction, emission reductions of CO2 annually. In fact, these buses will bring about 250,000 tons of reduction of emissions of CO2 annually in our city. So that's good news story for our air quality and it's a good news story for Toronto. So that's something I'm excited about this week because I think it's important that you, you share these stories, that we share these stories about good things that are happening at City Hall in parallel to and up against COVID. Things are still moving forward at City Hall despite this global pandemic. So I've got a few pictures for you, not as interesting as the last speaker. Oh, those were awesome pictures. I want copies of all of them. They were amazing. I'm sorry you had to rush through those for me because I'm a bit duller than that, but I do have a few photos and we're gonna put them up as I'm speaking to talk a little bit about Midtown and focus. Let's focus on the area we live in, Young and Eglinton, Davisville Village, and uh, kind of slipping into Lee side a bit. I have to tell you there are 124 cranes in our skies right now in Toronto more than any other city in North America. And this is, this is not exactly something to brag about, unlike the green buses, because it's very taxing on the infrastructure of the city. Most of those are in the Young Eglinton area. People used to think all the development and builds were happening in downtown Toronto or Young and Shepherd, but now it's all happening in Young and Eglinton and shifting east along the cross town that's being built. So developers have purchased and assembled properties along that, that belt, the uh, transit line that will be open shortly, well, in, the, in a year or two, probably more like two. And they've assembled properties and they're um, quickly, aggressively trying to create very built form situations that are maybe a little over the top. And so um, just to put that in context, the city with the highest number of active cranes is Seattle with 43. I think I, just to let the host know, we're trying to get the presentation up and running, but um, apparently it's been disabled by the host. So if the host could kindly allow us to put the, um, my presentation oh. up. Oh, I, let, I shared this like, that made you co-host. Okay. Can you make up? Parker Samuels co-host because oh he's okay actually... uh, certainly sorry about that okay that's okay don't worry about <laughs> it they're not it's not all it won't, you know we don't really have to have them but it no, that's makes even... it a bit more interesting to see some pictures I love a picture Vis visuals so, good there you go it Over is here. good I think it's a good addition so good. um I'm just going to keep my eye on the time here because I want to leave a chunk of time for questions but the issue is that we've got a third of all the cranes here in Toronto in North America. And I say, some people might think that's wonderful, but if you don't have the infrastructure to support it, when I say infrastructure, I mean many things. Part of it is green infrastructure, green space, parks, pay, places for people to sit on benches and public amenities, that's a problem. And that is a problem at Young and Eglinton. Very, very serious park deficit at Young and Eglinton. Not a blade of grass in some parts of Young and Eglinton, all concrete with more aggressive developments coming. Sarah, you may know the local organization that works very hard to uh, really protect the neighborhood. They're the South Eglinton Ratepayers Association, Residents Association. They've done a, a number of um, 
you know, document re research documents and, and analysis on these issues. And they project the population in the southeast quadrant, where some of you live, of Young and Eglinton, will increase by 75%. It may be higher. So Midtown surpasses its growth targets over and over again. They were created in 1991 by the province, what the growth targets should be. We've surpassed them over and over and over again since 1991. So my position is we've done our bit. Uh, let's move this to another area where we can actually support the growth with the infrastructure. So we don't have enough parks, as I've said. We don't have enough schools. I'm actually having a meeting with the local trustee on Monday. She's extremely concerned about the schools that are at capacity or over capacity. Where are we supposed to put these kids? We don't have enough libraries. We don't have enough medical um, outlets. We don't have enough um, basic, basic things like water and sewer pipes to accommodate this level of growth. And not to scare you, but there's times where we have trouble pumping the water up and are using containers, large scale containers to deal with those water issues. So it's a real concern. And um, this has been something I've talked about for years at city council till I'm blue in the face at North York Community Council, at uh, executive committee and at planning and growth committee. Four committees, I've talked about it. Honestly, you could create a loop of me talking about it repeatedly. So I want to tell you a little bit about Midtown in Focus, which is our next slide. And the built form and growth analysis was studied and worked on by not just city staff and the local councillors, but also by uh, residents. Residents were very involved. And here are the four things that we focused on. And uh, I will tell you that... Um, I have, I have to tell you, I put my heart and soul into this. I worked night and day on it, uh, particularly at the end. Not so much before that. I was involved periodically, went to the meetings. But in the last six months, I worked night and day on this. And we were able to get some of the building heights down to a more reasonable size. I was very pleased. Uh, there were still going to be towers, but there were some more mid-rises in the mix. And guess what? Uh, that went to the province of Ontario for approval, the Midtown and Focus Secondary Plan, and the province of Ontario overruled it. And they, after basically close to eight years of work that went in by many, many people, it was overturned fully by the province of Ontario. And they did not adopt it or accept it. And instead, they uh, increased the size of the towers and basically gave developers a bit of a heyday. So I wanna give you an example. The next slide shows you a great example of what's happened. This is Mount Pleasant. You may know the area very well. And what was proposed before the Midtown and Focus was something that wasn't actually that popular. Quite frankly, it was a nine story building. There it is in the first slide. The gray slide shows the nine story building. That was before Midtown and Focus and that would have been approved under Midtown and Focus, but people weren't even crazy about that. But after the provincial government got hold of this and overturned our plan, this is the new proposal on the right. And the new proposal is 27 stories tall. So if you look at that picture for even a minute, you see this is not characteristic of the neighborhood. There's no other tall towers. 27, tower, 27 towers on that middle mid block of, a, of a, a street like Mount Pleasant. This is, not, this is not main street builds. This really is a breach of that. And you see there's only low rises all around it, nothing even relatively close to that. And so unfortunately, because of the province's intervention, we've ended up with this. Now, it has not been approved and we're fighting it as a collective, as a neighborhood. But um, this is what we're faced with. And, and listen, there are towers going up that are way taller than this in the Midtown area, Young and Eglinton. There's proposals for 60 stories, 75 stories, all of them outrageously taller than what the zoning bylaw and the official plan permit. So this is, this is a, a very difficult time for us at City Hall, and we're doing our best to deal with it. I would say that there's so many ripple effects from this constant construction, roads are congested, dust and dirt, traffic infiltration, 
de you know, deficiencies of um, parks and green spaces and schools, as I said, that are at capacity. Not to mention as the chair of the TTC, I'm very, very concerned to say that we are at capacity on the line one, young line. We are at capacity. People wait three or four trains to get on at Young and Eggington and Young and Davisville in the morning, peak hours. Not now during COVID, this is pre-COVID, but we will get back to a normal world and it will be that way again. So um, it's a big problem. These things that are listed here in front of us that are affecting like lack of sidewalk space, et cetera. COVID has changed our world, changed our world forever. And I hope for the good. I hope there'll be a lot of good outcomes after we get through this third wave. There won't be another wave and we'll get needles in arms and we'll be able to enjoy our summer. But I know that things will dribble on into the fall. Um, so this is the thing I wanna end on for this piece is the TTC is maxed out on Young Street. We can't hold another person. Someone told me a story last week where their daughter was traveling north on the subway up to York Mills to get on to travel south down to downtown to work. Not during COVID again, but this is what we're dealing with. So uh, these are very important issues we need to face. And like I said, um, transit, we have a big system in the city. 730,000 people ride line one, the young line, every single day on the weekdays, not the weekends. It's not that high. But 730,000 riders daily and um, 68 uh, 68,000 daily trips from Eglinton to from Eglinton Station for a great neighborhood to exist, the livability, the, pros the prosperity, and also just getting around the city via transit. We have to make sure that we have uh, the capacity and we're expanding our transit systems um, to ensure we can meet the needs of future generations. So on that note, I'll, I am wrapping up and I'm looking forward to some of your questions. Thank you. Um, one thing I've noticed, uh, the jamming from Eglinton. Eglinton was the original north boundary of the subway. And so of course all the buses came into there. Now we've moved up to, to Finch and yet uh, Eglinton still seems to have the lion's share of buses. Is that something that you've taken into consideration? Oh, you're muted, Jay. Just to be clear on your question, you're, are you, what are you suggesting that they should be um, that demand response, like they should be moved north, the buses, or well, I'm sure I'm not sure what your um, question is. It, it's yes, having the other stations take some of the load. Off oh, of I see. Okay, so we are doing this massive analysis right now, Susan, on these issues. Um, we call it demand response. We're trying to be more nimble and pivot. Uh, this, I'm going to tell you the TTC has not been known for those things. No. Uh, it's a bit of a dinosaur organization. So I've been working on transforming the TTC to a modern organization. That's been my commitment and my focus. So we are looking at those very issues and we are working on a report right now that will address those things and uh, where the demand is getting the, uh, whether it's uh, no matter what mode of transit it is, getting those to those neighborhoods. Thank you. I yeah, I have a question about young uh, the um, LRT along. Um, I, I live right at Eglinton. I live on Downfield. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm Pat. Hi, Pat. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I live uh, right on Downfield at Young and Eglinton, and the 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 pavement is absolutely disgraceful from. Young Street to Mount Pleasant because they've been building the LRT, but they haven't even like for it's now five years at least. They could have made it um, at least smooth, like okay, it's a temporary situation, but it's been too long. I mean, and the it's it's dangerous, and 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 the street the 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 pavement goes wide and narrow and it's, it's flooded and it's up and down i mean they should do something if it's going to be another two years 
they should that the the company should at least make the street walkable and decent and and i mean you know in cuba they were doing construction and it was all neat where the the where it was blocked off from the construction here it's a mess like the builders don't care about the pedestrians that's yeah. the way i feel they care about getting the cars through but it's a lot of older people live up here and we you know we've got to go to metro and shoppers and um it's been like that for for a few years and it's it's just not been improved and it's going to be another two years it's crazy so you pat know, thank you very much yeah thank you for your comments uh, i would agree with you metrolinks has not done a brilliant job in their build and they do not really we represent the neighborhoods and they don't really care so i do i do represent the north side of um parts of the north side of eglinton it's a very weird boundary i don't represent the south side till we get to mount pleasant then it becomes my area but i think they owe it to the neighborhood after all these years of construction they owe it to the neighborhood to correct that so we will remind them of that but they are a provincial body i'm not trying to make excuses but they are a provincial body uh, and the provincial agency, and they're not the easiest ones to work with. Um, mm -hmm. But we will press for that. But uh, like I said, I share Eglinton with another councillor. So, but thank you. That's that's great feedback, and we will send that along. And also, oh, you would look out at the high rise. Well, it's already too late. It's already too late in this area with all the really like on Red Path, those ridiculous tall towers. And once they start building, once the LRT is finished. They still have permission in that square to build hard, big, tall buildings. Like the, the Ontario government, they're not going to stop that now. It's too late. Yeah. So this is something I'm um, very concerned about. Um, I have to tell you, I spend most of my evenings at development meetings because the aggressive behavior of developers and where they should be building mm -hmm. 15 stories, they're building... They're asking for 44 stories or higher. And so this is a real, this has to be stopped. It has to be stopped. And the thing is, how can people afford them? I mean, the people that are on the, in the, in the camp mm -hmm. or in red, uh, like uh, homeless, they can't afford those condos. Th those condos that are being built are not affordable to, you know, minimum wage earners. No. So they've got so to do sometimes something about yeah, so that's exactly what I say at City Council all the time. If you think these places are affordable, check the, check, check the price tags. We have condos going up where they're yeah. millions. They're literally millions of dollars, millions and millions. I, there's one that's quite, uh, quite exclusive boutique, $4 million for a unit. $4 million. So they're not affordable, and people are fooling themselves if they think that that's going to help the problem. Because they're not affordable, not even remotely. I mean, you'd have to be upper, 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 upper income to afford a lot of these condos. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I just want to. You know, the complaint that, um, I'm sorry, I lost who was complaining. You know, up here ah. in Bain and Finch area, I'm sorry, we have a terrible problem with Metro Links and the construction that's going on up in Downsview. I mean, Finch Avenue, right. wow. um, all the way from Keel Street to um, Highway 427 is just terrible. And, you know, I'm getting a new car and it's like, I won't even be driving it in this area because it, the roads are just a mess and really let alone for pedestrians and there are a lot of pedestrians in the Jane and Finch area and somebody's going to get killed um, and it's very sad because nobody's paying attention and with the cars going through and you know it, I don't know what the solution is but it's not just your area it's it seems to be across Toronto. Yeah, the whole city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because they're building new trains and new rails and, you know, 
Excuse oh, yeah. me. Condos, of course. Let, let, let me just interject. I think we want questions directly to, to Jay, is to bring us back on, on task. That's okay. You know what? I'll just comment on that because it's a very good point. It is widespread. I think Midtown and Focus, though, statistically, Midtown in the Midtown area is taking the biggest uh, hit right now from a development perspective. When you look at the stats and the number of applications that are uh, being po poised in this area. Um, I would say to both of you that pedestrian safety is uh, why I started a program called Vision Zero to try to help protect pedestrians. And thank goodness we did because it's helped a bit, but not enough because it's almost impossible. The city's growing in leaps and bounds and pedestrians are not safe. And I know even when I go out, I'm nervous. So um, we are doing our best, but people have to slow down. Uh, and some of these, you know, agencies like Metrolinks are very difficult to partner with and work with. And they're, they don't know the neighborhoods and they're not focused on, on those things that we are as locals that want to protect our neighborhoods and our pedestrians, people trying to navigate the city on foot, which we all like to do. So great, those are great points. And we all want to take the TTC the better way. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so might I ask a question? So we have, uh, I agree with you. But Trigo has a system that began a hundred years ago but it has something called the L. I, I doubt very much Toronto would ever approve that, an elevated train. But the, the, the key part about parks, so, I mean, one thing we, 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 and we have many areas in the city, like Transfig Park as an example, or even the immediate neighborhood. But if we start uh, doing what some parts of Toronto have done, I'll use the example of University of Toronto, where they took, I think it's George Street, they narrowed it from four lanes to two. So if we start doing more of that, and in other parts of Toronto, for example, Mount Pleasant, narrow to two, and then you expand and put green space on the side. That, I mean, I know the, the car people were just about of cardiac arrest. Do you think there's any energy <laughs> <Yeah>. for that? <laughs> well, there is, there is, um, you know what, maybe quite not quite that uh, focused, but um, I would like to see, I don't know, you know, the last time you've been downtown, but I recently was downtown. And there literally is no green space there. You don't even see a blade of grass, as I said earlier. I mean, and I just wish we had a, been more, had more vision when we were building the city. It's hard when the city's so built up to kind of go back. But every chance I'm pushing for green space in every, every area we can. But that's a very innovative idea. Um, we are doing some of that, but not, not necessarily with grass. Uh, in areas like Young and Dundas, uh, some of that will be happening, but not with grass. They're doing it more to create more pedestrian space. Other questions, people? So, Jay, what can we do as people who... Uh, connect with the neighborhood. I think of, I mean, we can talk about petitions and other things. I know at Manor Road, instead of building townhouses, we built this uh, park for people. So is, is there a way to, uh, and I know uh, when, you, when you cite examples, the historically relating to Victor, there was 47 squares slated for the city of Toronto in 1850. We have three left. So how do we uh, circumvent uh, conc the concretization of, of whatever green space we do have and, and make it more, 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 much more difficult for people to clear out the trees. I mean, any thoughts? Yeah, it's, it's really, you know what, it's a very difficult thing, but I would tell you there is some good news. City council is now saving most trees that go through uh, the appeal process. It's very rare if almost never that city council doesn't support it. So if you see a tree in jeopardy, uh, where there's a proposal to take it down, write your local city councillor, write the uh, community council, write um, city council, and uh, let them know that you would like it preserved. So you know what, these people don't realize writing is very effective in this day and age. I know people don't think it, but every councillor reads their emails, and when they see people are advocating, if people aren't advocating, they're not going to really think about it twice. But if there's av people advocating, it makes a difference. So my, my last kind of comment here would be stay engaged, 
stay in tune what's happening in your neighborhood, you know, protect your neighborhood, keep an eye out for the trees and the green infrastructure. And if you know they're being challenged to write to your local city councillor um, or write to the forestry division. We have a whole division of, a whole division of staff that focus on uh, tree preservation in forestry. So it's very important to stay engaged, write letters, make phone calls when you think, when you see things that you love are being threatened. It does work. I know people think, oh, it won't matter a hoot if I write a letter, I'm not gonna be engaged. It's not true. It still works. The old letter writing campaign is still valuable and a good way to remain engaged in your neighborhood. So I always encourage people to um, continue to engage in your neighborhood, your community, and your city. Thank you, Jay. You are remarkable. So I want to thank you for being part of us. It will definitely have you back. And oh, I love it. Definitely. And uh, Susan, do you want to say a bid farewell and uh, closing remarks? Yes, well, thank you all for coming, both our speakers and our audience. Uh, next week, we're welcoming back Kelly Snow, uh, who will speak on the environment and what we can do, especially during these times, which really threw a spanner into the whole green movement because you can't bring your own cup anymore and disposable masks. But uh, we hope you keep coming, tell your friends about us, and we hope to see you next week. Thank you again, Jay. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye.